Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our presentation on integrated pest management for weeds. My name is Connie Yip, and I will be your host this evening. Let's get started, and I'm going to introduce our speaker, Susan Fritz. Susan was born and raised in central San Joaquin Valley on one of the agricultural research stations of the University of California, where her dad was a superintendent. She was surrounded by orange groves from an early age, and she was especially fond of ornamental gardening as a child. She holds a degree in food science from UC Davis, has worked at Contadina Foods in Riverbank, which is near Modesto. She did that for three years. And then she went to Blommer Chocolate Company in Union City for 24 years. While living in Newark, she met her husband, Dave, and they moved into a home in Fremont where there were six raised beds in the backyard. From then on, it has been an adventure learning about how to grow vegetables, herbs, and berries. Susan became a master gardener in May of 2014 and has led the Speakers Bureau for five of those six years. She enjoys teaching the public about gardening and how they can improve the methods they use to make them more sustainable. So let's all welcome Susan. You have the floor. Thank you so much for that introduction, Connie. And a welcome to everybody that is here this evening. It's a, a pleasure to get a chance to speak with you and talk to you about a problem that many, many of us have. And so we'll be talking about integrated pest management for weeds. And so I'd like to go ahead and get started. So let's go on. In this particular presentation, we'll talk about the definition of integrated pest management. That's an awfully long name. And so we'll go through that. We'll talk about identification of weeds and biology of weeds. We'll talk about particular weeds and what situations may cause them. We'll talk about how to manage the weeds that you currently have and how to prevent future ones from happening. And so let's get started. I always like to know a little bit about you. And because we're on Zoom, I don't get a chance to interact with you. And so we're going to have our first polling question. What is your level of gardening experience? The first answer is I've never grown a garden before. One to two years of experience, three to five or five plus years. About everybody's this photo is going to vote. So a good, you know, half of you have five plus years experience. That's great. But the other half of you um, have a lot less than that. And many of you have never grown a garden before at all. So you're kind of giving yourself a head start, um, especially with weeds. They can be such a difficult problem. And if you start off knowing how to manage them, you'll have a lot more success. I can't tell you how many mistakes I made when I first started gardening just because I didn't know what I was doing. So good, great for you for being here. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. And we will um, talk more about weeds. So why do we want to manage weeds? What's the big deal about them? Well, one of, the, one of the worst things I think weeds do is that they take up water and nutrients and sunlight that should go to the plants that we want to grow. And so that to me is like the primary reason. But they do some other things too. They create harborages for rats and mice and insects that may cause pest issues. They can be hazards in you know, the separations in your sidewalk. If you have weeds growing there, people can trip over those. So it can be dangerous. And you see this picture of this young child playing in the grass. Well, if you look at this picture, there's clover growing in that grass. And that's usually created by a particular problem. And bees love clover. So if you have a child and you have bees, you could have a, a serious problem if that, bee, if that bee stings a child or somebody else even. So you always wanna take that into consideration. 
a lot of people just don't like the way weeds look. They make your garden look just messy and unkept. So let's take a look at some of the other information that we need to know about integrated pest management. First off, we're going to start talking about the definition of this. So integrated, what does that mean? We're going to take all these different science-based um, practices that have been proven to work and use them together to manage the problem that we have. And notice it doesn't say you're going to get rid of them entirely. You're going to just manage them. And to what level you manage them is dependent on you and what you would be satisfied with. We're going to look for long-term solutions and pesticides are really a last resort. There are a lot of other things we can do besides um, whipping out a, a bottle of herbicide. So one of the most important things that you can do when you're dealing with a pest problem, and this is whether it's insects or weeds, is to identify the problem correctly. That is the first step in integrated pest management. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you around this page with my laser pointer. Weeds are split up into three groups based on the type of leaf they have. So we have broad leaves, grasses, and sedges. And I'll go over them in that order, the way that I showed them to you. So let's look at the broad leaves. What's important about those? So we have a picture here of a, an example of a broad leaf weed called oxalis. And indeed, the leaves are wide, so they live up to their name. And they have branching veins. So what does that mean? Well, if you look on this photo, you'll see that there's a vein running down the center of the leaf and the other veins come off of that. And so those are the branching veins that you look for in a broadleaf. And those are probably some of the easiest ones to identify. So let's move on to the grasses. So down here, I see that I have Dallas grass and I have large crabgrass. Who hasn't seen crabgrass in a lawn before? Well, but we'll talk about that a little bit later as to why that happens in lawns. So if you notice, these particular weeds have narrow leaves. The veins all run in parallel one to the other. They don't come off of a main one. They all just run in the same direction up and down the leaf. And the leaves are arranged in sets of two on the various sides of the stem. So there would be two here and then two here. The stem is round or flat. And that helps you to really separate these from the next class, the third class, which are the sedges. Now, this photograph of a yellow nut sedge and this drawing don't really do it justice because when you're talking about a triangular stem, that's really hard to draw. And so what I have here is I have a raised bed that I have um, overwatered, and that's what primarily leads to sedge growing in um, a particular area. And But I wanted to show you against this white piece of paper, the three sides of this. You notice the white part of this? It actually has three sides. So it literally is triangular in shape. So that's something that you can use to help you identify which classification your weed falls into. It also happens that with sedges that you'll have three leaves growing off the same side. You know, so you'll have three coming in sets of three. So let's move on. So we have these three classes, broad leaves, grasses, and sedges. And why is that important to know? Because it will open up an entire 
group of information for you on the UC IPM website. And our chat box monitor, Sandy, will be putting the link for the UC IPM website into the chat box for you, as well as the weed gallery, which is part of the UC IPM website. Now, if you notice, the weed gallery starts off with those three classifications that I talked about. So once you know those three, then you can start looking up specific information about the weeds that you're having problems with in your yard. Because what happens is once you select a broadleaf, it goes a little bit deeper and shows you some, a variety of broadleaves to pick from. And then it'll give you photos of specific weeds that meet the, the descriptions that you've provided. And what ultimately does that lead to? It leads to what we call pest notes. And you notice this one's particular to dandelions. It'll give you a picture of the weed and what it might look like in different stages of its growth. It'll talk about, you know, what does it look like? What does it do? How does it grow? When does it grow? And it'll talk about its life cycle. How does it spread via seeds? Does it spread via underground roots? And then it will also talk about what control measures you can use that are effective. In addition to this, we are, we are uh, providing you with a downloadable um, document that will give you the links to all of this information. There'll be separate links for each of these things. And other items that I will mention later on in the presentation. So that sheet will have quite a lot of things on it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's do polling question number two, Connie. What are some reasons to remove weeds from your landscape? Okay, Connie, let's go ahead and end the polling. And that's wonderful. It looks like 91% of you understood that all of those things are some reasons to remove weeds from your landscape. And as I mentioned when I was speaking before, um, I believe that the most critical reason is that weeds use up water and nutrients and sunlight that could go to the plants that you want to grow. Okay, so let's continue. So what makes some plants so successful as weeds? I think of weeds as the all-stars of the plant kingdom because they have developed ways, evolved ways to really be competitive. They may grow quickly. They may produce hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant. Some of them even will produce seed that will become waterproof and persist in the soil for up to 60 years. They also will have, in some cases, under or overground ways of persisting from year to year. And so what I'd like to talk about first are tubers. Now, the tuber that you're seeing there, this is actually a picture of a nut sedge. Remember that sedge that had the triangular uh, shaped stem? Well, I have, as I said, a bed where I have a problem with this particular weed. And what I'm going to show you is what that tuber looks like in real life. The tuber is the round part at the bottom. It's black or dark brown. And that is called the nut of a nut sedge. That's actually a tuber. And I also have another plant that reproduces with bulbs underground. This is actually called Bermuda buttercup. 
and it was originally from the Cape of South Africa, where it is now endangered, but is doing quite well here in California. Now with this particular weed, you'll see that there are many, many bulbs. I dug this up a few days back. There can be anywhere from 12 to 20 bulbs per plant. So this is how that plant persists from year to year. We also have plants that have stolons. Remember that oxalis that we saw earlier? That one spreads with stolons. Stolons are basically overground growths that can re-root in other places. And this is how this plant continues to spread and lasts from year to year. Other plants produce rhizomes. These are basically underground roots that can send up a new plant further down and then the plant will just die back and it'll can continue from year to year to send up new growth. We're going to continue on and talk about what are some of the reasons why weeds might be invading a particular part of my yard. Well, if you look at this picture down here, you see that these are some dandelions growing. And when I see that picture, I think to myself, there must have been some point in time when that soil was bare of lawn. So it was just exposed because dandelion seeds love to float and fly through the air. They look for bare ground, they take root. And so maybe you had something happen there. Maybe there was a gopher there and you tamped the, the soil back down again, but didn't have any lawn seed to put there. And so the dandelion seeds will be more than happy to grow there instead. Now, if you look at this other example, you'll see that there are weeds growing around a leaky irrigation pipe. So you can have all kinds of reasons to have weeds that are, um, from different reasons. Some other items that love to grow in waterlogged conditions are the sedges. Remember that I talked about those sedges with the triangular stems? I have a bed that I overwatered and I probably did it a couple years in a row and sedges are growing there and now I have to deal with them. Annual bluegrass also likes to grow in uh, waterlogged conditions. And remember what we talked about here? This is crabgrass. Crabgrass loves water. So if you are looking at your lawn and you see that there, you may be overwatering in that particular area and you should cut back, you know, remove the weed and then um, reseed it with the correct lawn seed, and then you should not have a continued problem. Okay, if you have open bare soil, that is an invitation for weeds. So we'll talk later on in my uh, presentation about what you can do to cover up bare soil so that you don't allow these other weeds to grow. So spotted spurge, this is very common. I've had it in my yard for many years. Um, I don't get much of it anymore because I've been persistent about weeding it out. We also have some weeds that like to grow in lawns that have not received enough nitrogen fertilizer because your lawn would normally outcompete these weeds. They would grow faster than these weeds could. But if you haven't fertilized your lawn, you might actually be creating a situation that could lead to weeds. So be sure to fertilize your lawn if you have one. Okay, let's do polling question number three. What is the first step in using integrated pest management methods for weed problems? Okay, Connie, let's go ahead and close the poll and share those results. Wow, 
I like to see that. That's one of the critical things I wanted you to take away from this talk tonight is that identifying the weed correctly is where you need to start. So we can go ahead and stop sharing that and we'll continue. So we've talked about weeds being divided into three uh, different leaf types, but they are also divided by the life cycle that they follow. The, there are two life cycles, annuals and perennials. As far as I know, there are no biennial weeds. So the first one we'll talk about are the annual weeds. And I'm just gonna let this run and talk about this process. So if you look at this little piece of ground, that's what that is, you'll see a, you know, a couple of weed seeds and you'll see a small plant that has sprouted from those seeds or germinated, we use the same terminology. And that plant grows and then it sends up flowers. Those flowers get pollinated. The plant dies, but it leaves its seeds behind. And that is how that plant persists from year to year. The plant itself dies, but the weed seeds persist. So that's an annual weed. We'll take a look at a few pictures of annual weeds. And if you look at these, they're pretty small. These are young weeds. They have not sent up a flower. This is the point in time when you want to remove that weed. Just pull it out of the ground. Now, the next one are perennial weeds. And we have a couple of examples here. Remember that oxalis, it keeps coming back. That is an annual, a perennial weed, excuse me. Remember it has those overground stolons that allow it to persist. And then we have Bermuda grass. Now, when I was growing up out in the Central Valley, this was our lawn when I was growing up. And it would, it actually grows with rhizomes, underground, growth that persists from year to year and overground stolons as well. And it would die back completely in the winter time. It would turn brown and it would come back in the spring. And that's what perennial weeds do. So we're going to go through this process a little bit more slowly than we did with the annuals. So you see we have some seeds here, but we also have a plant that Looks like it's not doing that well, but it's got this underground growth. So this grows. So the, some of the seeds sprout and create new little plants. And then we have the other one that had the persisting um, root underground and it is sent up new growth and it's going to send up more. And look what happens. This one that, that sprang from a seed sets up a flower and so does the other one. And then it simply dies back. Notice the top growth just wilts, turns brown, but you still have all of this underground root system that will persist from year to year. It overwinters and whatever seeds came from these flowers will also be in the soil and then it just repeats itself. Now, the reason this is circled, that is when you would want to remove these weeds so that you don't end up with this problem and you don't end up with seeds. So control the parts or seeds before they form. So, when should weeds be managed? There are three important times. Before you plant an area, if you want to plant a new bed, make sure you take care of the weeds that are there before you plant anything. Otherwise, you'll be fighting 
between the weeds and the plants that you want to grow. Okay, so my alarm has gone off. That means my, we're at the half hour mark. I just wanna remind you to please um, get your questions into the chat box monitor so she has time to collate them and present them to me at the end of the presentation. So we want to control before we plant, before weeds emerge, and before weeds mature. So let's take a look at this. When we're planting, we want to prepare the site, and we do that by weeding or other methods. We'll talk about those later. Before they emerge, and we'll use competitive plants, and we'll apply mulch to prevent weeds from growing. And then we want to manage weeds before they mature, which means before they send up their flowers. Because remember those flowers turn into seeds. Now we'll do that by cultivating a fancy word for weeding, or we can mow them depending on how large our problem is. <clears throat> The time when we don't want to be managing weeds is after the seeds have been formed and they get sent all over and before those vegetative underground or overground parts are created that can persist from year to year. Okay, let's do polling question number four, Connie. <clears throat> what are the three main leaf forms of weeds? Okay, Connie, I think we can go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so it looks like 93% of you understood that the three main leaf forms are broadleaf, grasses, and sedges. If you know that information, again, you've taken away some of the most important knowledge that I could give you this evening. Once you know that, those three things, it opens up a whole world of knowledge for you by going to our UCIPM website. Okay, we can go ahead and stop sharing that. So let's talk specifically about how to get weeds out before you plant an area. You can dig out what's existing there so if you're trying to replace a lawn, you can dig the whole thing out. Or if you just have a weedy patch, you can dig it all out. Um, you need to make sure that you're getting rid of the perennial weeds, which are the more difficult weeds to get rid of. You need to make sure that you get rid of the annual weeds, which are relatively easy to do. But you have to realize that that soil that you have just exposed is still filled with millions of weed seeds. I know that's hard to believe, but it is true. So you dig out whatever's there, just remove it. And then there's a method that we like to use called cultivate, which means weed, irrigate. So you're gonna water it and then you're gonna cultivate. You're gonna go back later and weed it again. And you're going to go through that cycle multiple times, maybe over, a couple of months until you have created a layer about one to one and a half inches deep that is relatively weed seed free. Won't be completely free, but you will have reduced the amount of weeds in that top layer so that you don't end up with a problem later on. Or you can also solarize the soil. And there, this is a particular method that has been proven to work quite well in um, raised beds and you know, over specific areas of soil that you want to prevent weeds from growing. Or if you choose, you can use a non-selective herbicide um, to help you eliminate your weed problem. So I'm going to go on to the next slide because it's a summary of these methods, and I hope that it will help clarify what you are supposed to do. 
So remember, we talked about you're going to cultivate first. You're going to dig out all of the weeds that you possibly can. You have the option to solarize the soil. Notice that the soil here has been leveled out. It's been prepared. It's been, it's been prepared so that it's the way that you want it when you're going to be ready to plant your plants. Solarization is done by soaking the soil down 12 inches and then laying clear plastic, not opaque plastic. <clears throat> you must use polyethylene. It needs to be maybe two to four mils thick and it should have a UV protector in added to it to prevent it from breaking down in the sunlight. You're going to roll this plastic onto the soil and you're going to put it on as close to the soil as you can, eliminating as many air gaps as you can. You're going to either lay soil on the top of the plastic, around the edges to hold the edges down, or I've used bricks, I've used boards, whatever I have available to hold that plastic down. And the concept here is that the sun's rays will pass through this plastic and heat the soil. And that will kill the weed seeds that are in your soil. Now, in order to have the warmest days possible, you need generally to have the longest days possible to do this. And so generally, we use the date of, Jan of June 21st. You count back two or three weeks and forward two or three weeks. And that's the time when you put the plastic on your soil. So I'm getting, I have prepared one of my beds to do this, solar so uh, this solarization. I'm going to put the plastic on on June 1st and I'm going to take it off on July 15th. And it will be ready for me then to plant a cool season garden and just be ready to go. It'll eliminate the weeds from that soil. So once you solarize the soil, you should be ready to plant. Now with the cultivate water or irrigate and cultivate method, this may take even longer than the solarization method. And the solarization method is outlined in a handout that's on that downloadable document that we're giving you. It explains the entire process of how to do that. So let's go on to the cultivate, irrigate, cultivate method. So essentially what you do is you prepare your soil, you remove the weeds to start. Okay, you dig them all out. You even off your soil, prepare it how you want it to look when you're gonna be ready to plant. And then you water it. And you think to yourself, well, isn't that going to make all the weed seeds grow? Yes, that is the point. What you're trying to do here is grow those weeds, <clears throat> remove them, grow, grow it again, remove them, and you do this over and over again, maybe over a period of a couple of months until you really don't get much more uh, weeds germinating when you water. So, that's a pretty labor intensive method, but it's, you know, it's work, but you didn't apply any herbicide for either the solarization or the cultivate, irrigate, cultivate. Now, if you want to, you can, in this cultivate, irrigate process, also, instead of hand weeding, hand cultivating, you can use a non-selective herbicide. So what you would do is you would remove the weeds manually, you would water it, you know, you prep the soil so it's in the shape that you want it, 
you water it, you, you wait for the weeds to come up and you spray it with a non-selective herbicide and you want to disturb the soil as little as possible. Remember, you're just trying to keep that one and a half inch layer of soil undisturbed. You're just watering it, weeding it, watering it, doing that over and over again until you created that one and a half inch of soil that does not have weeds in it. Now, why do I have weight written here? If you decide to use a non-selective herbicide, you must wait the specified amount of time on the package before you plant anything. Otherwise, your plants will die. So those are the three methods that you can use to remove weeds from a patch of soil. So we're getting ready to plant our plants. You want to make sure that the soil can hold water and nutrients. You may want to add compost to it. You want to make sure it has good drainage. You can go online and learn how to determine whether it has good drainage. Usually it involves digging a hole, adding water, and seeing how quickly the water flows away. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to put plants in that can establish quickly to cover up that bare soil. Remember, we don't want bare soil. So choose vigorous plants that are adapted to the local environment and plant, plant ground covers where you may have bare areas. Prevent weeds with mulches. So this is the best part. You can stop weeds from ever coming up by using these methods. So mulch can be um, usually a layer of fabric mulch not plastic fabric, landscape fabric. Um, and you can use organic mulch or you can use rock mulch. Now these um, block light from the soil. That is how you are preventing the weeds from growing, is by blocking the light. If you put mulch down on bare ground and you see gaps and you see the soil, Weeds will grow there because the light is hitting the soil. That's the whole purpose of mulch is to block light. Um, but they also hold moisture in. So during these drought times that we're currently having, that's a big advantage. And if you're using an organic mulch, it can actually improve the soil as it breaks down over time. So let's take a look at some of these organic mulches. Now, maybe contrary to the way that you think, but if you buy big mulch like this, you actually have to put a deeper layer than if you purchased a smaller mulch, which compacts more. You would have more likelihood of having a big gap in your mulch with one of these pieces if it rolled out of place than you would if you had this in just a two inch layer you would actually have to put down maybe up to four inches of this material in order to achieve the same thing you would with the smaller mulch with a two inch layer. So make sure that you keep it away from the base of your plants though, because you don't want to create a situation where you'd have root rot. So you can create a you know three or four inch gap around trees, uh, maybe a one or two inch gap around small plants to prevent that from happening. But these do break down over time. They do need to be replenished. And so you need to make sure that you keep the level of mulch the same from year to year. And it is more effective if you use a landscape fabric, not a plastic. Rock mulches, of course, you don't have to um, replace these because they don't break down, which is a nice thing about them. However, they are difficult to keep clean. And what they mean by that is, if you have a planted, an, uh, if you've got this rock mulch underneath a tree or a shrub, the material, the leaves and whatever is going to fall into that rock. And it will actually create something that a weed seed can grow in. And it's really hard to weed a rock mulch. I know because I have some. And uh, 
If you have an area that doesn't have an overhead tree, doesn't have overhead plants, that you just want to have it look nice, this is the type of mulch that you could use. And again, putting it over landscape fabric um, works very well. So synthetic mulches, you use them generally underneath organic <clears throat> or rock mulches. And they allow air and water to flow through. And if you think about plastic, that can't happen with plastic. You also want to, to avoid sun exposure for these because they will break down more rapidly if they're exposed to the sun. So that's why you need to make sure they're covered. Now in this particular slide, it's going to illustrate how to use a synthetic mulch with an organic mulch. So you put the fabric down directly on the soil that you've already weeded. Remember, you've already prepared this and you're going to use U-shaped nails. They also sell um, fabric nails for these types of things. They look, they're, they're green nails that you literally hammer into the soil. Um, and then to prepare it to plant your plant, you cut an X in the fabric and then you remove soil to create a planting hole. You plant your plant and then you put the mulch around. Now you could do this entire bed, plant the whole thing and then put all the mulch around. It really doesn't matter if you wanna do it <clears throat> piecemeal, that's fine. So polling question number five, what makes weeds so successful? Okay, Connie, let's go ahead and end the polling and we'll share those results. Wow, 100% of you understood that, you know, weeds are successful because they can produce lots of seeds, they can live in conditions that other plants wouldn't like, and some of them have below and above ground growth that allows them to last from year to year. So we can stop sharing those results and continue on. So maintaining your mulch. You will get some weeds that will grow in your mulch, but it's a lot easier to weed mulch. And especially if you only have like one or two weeds to remove from it, because you've done such a good job of uh, preparing the soil before you put the mulch down at all. So you need to remove the weeds by hand and avoid disturbing the mulch. Remember what I talked about? If you have a gap in your mulch and you see exposed ground, the mulch is not doing its job and you could get weeds growing there. So make sure that you weed your mulch as you see them. And one thing that I would like to point out is that just this year, I decided that I wanted to have a way of weeding when I walk through my yard, I want to weed, be able to remove a weed as soon as. So I get, you know, plant gifts from people in these little buckets sometimes. So I have three of these buckets, different sizes and kinds. And I purchased three weeding tools that I really love. And I spread these out through my yard. So when I see a weed, I have the, I have the tool and I have a place to put the weed when I've weeded it. So it helps me, set me up for success. So remove weeds as you see them before they set seed. Don't forget that. Take out the entire plant. And you may need to um, water before you do this because that area might be dry. And so it's a lot easier to remove a weed when the soil is moist. Uh, grab the weed butt from its base and wiggle it a little bit and pull it out. So tools make weeding easier and I have a whole bunch of tools to show you. So we see a garden hoe that's great for removing annual weeds, a hula hoe the same thing, um, a dandelion puller is great for dandelions, and there are other tools here. But I have some weeds, uh, weed, uh, weeding tools that I really love, and I'm gonna share those with you tonight. I have a whole bunch of them. So 
This is my favorite tool. It actually is a trowel, but it's quite long. It's almost the length of this paper. It's uh, probably about seven, seven and a half inches long, but it's a lot narrower than a regular trowel. So you can imagine that you can dig down pretty easily into the soil. The only problem with this is that because it is so long, it is weaker. So you really need to go all the way around the weed first before you put any pressure on this particular weeding tool. But this is probably one of my favorites. It's got a pretty comfortable grip on it too. Now, I use my regular old trowel a lot too. So don't discount trowels, those work well as well. Now for dandelions, I also have this regular dandelion puller. You shove this into the soil along the dandelion's root and then you push, push down on the tool and that helps lift the dandelion root out. Then I also have this other dandelion tool and you can see it has a comfort grip on it. And, but it does the same thing. It has this nice comfort grip. So if you have issues with arthritis, that can help. I also like this particular tool as well. This is really good for annual weeds. This helps to loosen the soil around the weed. And then you kind of just hoe it out with this. And it's a, it's a small tool. So you, most of my weeding I have to do, you know, sitting down or on my hands and knees. And uh, so that's what I kind of expect to be doing. Now my last example is a favorite of many people. This is called a hori hori knife. And what's unusual about this particular tool, it was invented by the Japanese and it actually has serrations on one side. So if you're dealing with a particularly tough weed that has a really tough root, this might be a tool that you want because you can actually saw with it. It's also somewhat sharp. Notice how pointed that tip is. And it's very strong. That blade goes all the way through that handle. And so it's a very strong tool that you can use. Some people also, if they have issues with arthritis or they're uh, disabled in some way, they do make specialized tools. And you can see that this particular one may help with leverage because of this shape that's been added to the tool. There are many options as far as tools go. There are also some pretty simple methods. Hot water. The water has to be over 200 degrees Fahrenheit for this to work. So get out your tea kettle and boil some water. And this works really well on annual weeds. You can just go out and pour it on them and that will pretty much kill them. Or flaming. You notice that this is a you know, propane tank and it's got a flaming tool on the end. You need to be careful when you're doing this though. If you are near wood mulch or dry leaves, you could cause a fire. So be very care careful with this. But this works well in areas where you have concrete and you have weeds in the concrete. Now, a lot of people think that they have to actually scorch the weed. You do not need to scorch the weed. You simply need to wilt it, okay? So you don't want to you know, leave the flame there. You just literally are passing it over to kill the young weeds. They have to be young when you do this. Or weed-eating animals. Now this presentation was created by the UC IPM group. And so it's used across the state of California. And so you can imagine in the rural areas, you might have the option to use ducks, geese, or goats for weeding purposes. And that's wonderful. But if you're living in the city, it's not likely that you're going to have access to this, but that could be an option if you chose to use it. So the question is, do you really need herbicides? 
to deal with weeds in your yard? Well, hand weeding and mulching are very effective. And we've talked about the methods that um, are available to us and you don't have to use herbicides. Just use them for special situations. There are some perennial weeds that are extremely difficult to get rid of. And so in those situations, you know, after weeding them for several years, you may decide that you have to use an herbicide. But wherever you can use preventative methods, remember those preventative methods are landscape fabrics and mulches and weeding when you see the weed, get rid of it as soon as you can. If you do decide to use herbicides, always select one that is labeled for the weed that you're going to apply it to. And that it'll be safe around the other plants that you have. Because herbicides can really injure garden plants. Because remember, the garden plant's roots may go under the area that you're trying to treat. And so it could really damage some of your plants. Now, herbs are divided into four classes. Pre-emergent, so before seedlings emerge, they actually damage the weed seeds. A post-emergent, that means that the weed has to come up before you apply it. Selective, it kills a specific type or class of weeds. Excuse me, I, I skipped the last one. Or non-selective, and I've mentioned non-selective before. This means that it kills a broad group of weeds or most weeds. And you can have a non-selective herbicide that is pre-emergent and post-emergent. They do make those. So you can have combinations of these. And these are three different types of damage from three different types of herbicides from glyphosate, dicamba, and 2,4-D. Always follow the label. I know that that can be difficult to do because, you know, you're, nobody's watching over you. You're a homeowner or whatever. But please follow the label. It's for your safety and for, um, you know, why apply the wrong thing to, the, to your weeds um, if it's not going to work? And so you wanna make sure that it's um, registered for California, follow all the directions and only use the amount that's needed. I realize that um, many times homeowners believe that if I apply more fertilizer, that will be better. And if I apply more herbicide, that will be better. But it really isn't. Only apply what's stated on the package. It's not necessary to use too much. Don't over irrigate. That can mean that that herbicide could flow to other areas, um, you know, get into streams and lakes and places you don't want it to. Um, just make sure that you don't allow it to spread to other areas. And if you notice, we have somebody here who is actually applying an herbicide. He's got safety goggles on. He's got an easily removable suit on that's over his regular clothing. He's wearing gloves. And I know it's not visible in this picture, but he has boots on as well, because I've seen this picture and it's full size. Make sure that you protect yourself. Never apply a pesticide when it's windy outside. Usually the first time in the morning is the perfect time to apply an herbicide if you're going to apply one. Make sure it's not windy. Okay, let's do the last polling question, question number six. This one's a little bit tricky, okay? What are some methods that can be used to prepare a weedy area for planting after the existing weeds have been removed? So they've been physically removed somehow. The first answer is water the soil down to 12 inches, cover the soil with clear plastic for at least six weeks, and then plant. 
The next one is rake the soil, water the soil, and wait for weeds to appear. Remove weeds by hand. Repeat the process in parentheses until weeds are reduced to an acceptable level, and then plant. Rake the soil, water the soil, and wait for weeds to appear. Apply non-selective herbicide. Repeat the process in parentheses until the weeds are reduced to an acceptable level. Wait past the time recommended by the herbicide manufacturer and then plant. Or all of the above. This is a tough one, but it, it's um, for me to make a point with you, so. Okay, Connie, I think we can go ahead and end the polling and share those results. Okay, so remember I said this was a tricky question. 10% of you got the correct answer. And let me explain to you why these two selections are not correct. If break the soil had been outside of the parentheses, that would have been okay. Because the last thing you wanna do is disturb the soil after you started this water, weight, and weed. Remember, you don't wanna disturb the soil by raking it. You can do that to start to get the soil in the shape that you want it. But then after that, you wanna disturb it as little as possible. So you water, you wait for weeds to appear, and you remove the weeds, either by hand or by applying a non-selective herbicide. Then you water it again, and you disturb the soil as little as possible. So had these two options been written slightly differently, that would have been correct. Okay. We're very near the end. So let's go ahead and complete this. Is your approach working? Well, you should see your weeds decrease incredibly. If you're doing everything the right way, you put in competitive plantings, you put in like for here, this mow strip to prevent the lawn from growing into here. You created barriers where needed. You have well-maintained mulches. And you're not watering bare areas where you, you know, don't want weeds to grow. And you're removing weeds regularly, you're getting them as you see them, and before they set seed, congratulations to you. You have done a lot of things correctly to create a low weed environment in your yard. So we have a few little things to go over, managing weeds in lawns. Make sure you prepare the site, just like we talked about. Use a grass that will grow well in your area. Once your lawn is established, make sure that you fertilize it, water it, and mow it properly. Better to mow it high to uh, block out weeds than to mow it low against the ground. Remove weeds by hand and only use herbicides if needed. Managing annual beds. Use mulches, as we've talked about. If you're growing a vegetable garden, once you've pulled out your dead plants from the summer, you can grow a cover crop, and that will block out weed seeds from growing. And we've talked a lot about managing weeds in landscape beds. Again, put down landscape fabric and use those mulches that we talked about. Use ground covers. Managing weeds around trees. Make sure, remember we talked about leaving an area that's open so that trees can uh, not have the issue of water collecting around their base to cause root rot. <clears throat> For a temporary issue, if you have one, you can wet newspaper in layers. A newspaper will break down fairly quickly, but will also help to block light from the soil for a period of time to help you catch up on your weed problem. Managing weeds in hardscapes. 
you know, you have the options of using hand tools to dig out weeds. Remember we talked about flaming, um, use concrete barriers where you can. They're pretty effective for blocking weeds and make sure that you're filling any cracks and things like that if you can. And use hot water. That's an easy one to do. Okay, so we have come to the end of the presentation, but I have one last slide that I want to share with you. And this is about a weed that I want to ask you to grow. Um, as you may know, the monarch butterfly populations have declined by about 95%. And so part of that is because we've been so effective at eliminating the milkweed that monarch butterflies put their eggs onto. This is the only plant that monarchs will, will lay their eggs on. And so there are actually three types of milkweed that are grown natively in California. There's showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa, and narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepius fascicularius, and Asclepius californica. The californica type, as far as I understand, is not generally available in nurseries to purchase, but these other two types are. If you have an area of your yard that is well blocked off, maybe by concrete barriers of some kind, and you wanna grow you know, three or four of these plants, you will have the joy of seeing monarch butterflies fly away from your plant. They will eat your plant, of course, the caterpillars will, but um, you will be helping to promote the monarch butterfly and its migration. And so that is the end of my presentation. Um, we have lots of resources um, for you in that document that we provided you with, including about the monarch butterfly. So, Sandy, I believe I am ready to take questions. Okay, Susan, thank you so much. That was a great talk, very informative. Now, um, before we get into the questions, I'd like to state that if your question is not answered and has to do with a particular weed, to go to the site for the IPM weed documentation. This will, um, I've used it myself and you will find your specific weed in question there and that should help you uh, decide how to treat your problem. Okay, so let's, I'm going to say um, how to get rid of vine weed. Roots are so long and it's difficult, Susan. How would you say, mm -hmm. what would you say? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I have field bindweed in my yard. And let me tell you how it ended up in my yard. I planted morning glory one year. And the next year in another place in my yard appeared this other plant that looked just like it, but it was a little bit smaller and it only had one color. That was field bindweed. And I have been fighting it ever since. I have never gotten rid of it. And I have tried herbicides. I, and you know, as a last resort, I have tried herbicides because I have dug and dug and dug this weed. Let me tell you, it can have roots that can go down, I believe more than three feet. Yes. Anytime you dig it up, if you leave even a two inch piece of a root, in the soil, it will reroot. It sends lateral roots out and then sends up a new plant. It also sets seeds. Those seeds are the ones that I talked about that become water resistant and can persist in the soil for 60 years. This is a very mean weed. So this year, what I decided to try is persistent weeding. This is going to be a war of attrition on this weed. I will go out every four or five days and pull any new growth in hopes that what I will be doing is reducing the carbohydrate reserve 
in the roots of that weed. So I'm gonna give that a try. I'm gonna see if it works. And I know there are other people that have tried this, but you may have to do it for up to two years to get rid of this weed. <laughs> yes, it is horrible. So, well, thank you. I also <laughs> bite bind weeds. I'm right there with you. So we also have a question about the big problems with wild blackberries, spearmint, and ivy. Now, I will say my I have an ivy problem too, but it's because my neighbor planted it. Oh, no. And it migrates over on my side of the yard. And the only way, I mean, I, I have to say I do not use herbicides at all, but it has really made me think about using glyphosate, but I do not. Yeah. So any words of wisdom? Uh, yeah. Again, persistence pays off. Uh, peppermint, spearmint. I used to have mint growing in my yard. The previous owners had planted it in the soil. And because of where I grew up, we had mint growing, but it was literally surrounded by rocks. So it didn't have anywhere to spread to. So I knew that when I saw mint in my yard that I had a problem. And so it probably took me two or three years to get rid of all of it. And a few days ago, my husband told me that it reappeared in our <laughs> front yard. I don't I know. know how. I have no idea reason to think that it would end up there. But I mean, I haven't seen it in my backyard for over 15 years. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> these things, they have underground root systems. You have oh, to dig oh, the whole yes. root out and yeah. you have to be persistent. So how about red stem fillery? Oh my. Okay. I don't know anything about that weed. So I'm going to tell you that I can't give you any recommendations about it. So what I'm going to do is tell you, you know, figure out, is it broadleaf? Is it a grass? Is it a sedge? Most likely it's not a sedge. Um, and get the IPM pest note off the UC IPM website and read about it. And it will tell you what you can do. Here's another question, and I have to admit, I've never heard of this one. Um, how to reduce devil's bulb, north mm. coast scrotum, I scrotum, uh, gracil, gracil, is it? I'm sorry for my mispronunciation. I have never heard of that either. So again, I'll have to refer you to the UC IPM website. And for those of you that have difficulty identifying the weed, it sounds like you already know what it is. Um, you know, you can go right to the pest note and read about it and it will give you all kinds of recommendations about what you can do. Okay, our next question is, I already have weeds past the seed stage and have mm -hmm. seeds on them. I want to compost the materials. Can you go over methods? for composting weeds with seeds? Mm. Okay, I don't <laughs> recommend that you do that. And let um, me explain why. Yeah. Most compost piles that homeowners have do not get hot enough to kill weed seeds. So it's not recommended that you add weeds with the seeds on them to your compost pile. Put them in your yard waste bin. So you could cut off the seed head and put the leaves in. Is that you what could. you're saying? That's that's a lot of work. But you could you could cut the seed head off, yes. Okay. Um, does UC ANR or elsewhere have work have a worksheet for management times when too early and when just right for say Oakland? Example. In Virginia, VA, I guess is Virginia. Stilt grass, if mowed too early, will re-sprout seeds at a lower height than the lawnmower in the same year. And I have noticed that when you uh, mow the lawn, that sometimes the weeds adapt to not <laughs> going high enough to get mowed. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> um, they probably will make recommendations about timing. Yes, they definitely will. Um, I believe they do make like with the field bindweed. I do believe they make recommendations about when to apply herbicide when it would be most effective. I haven't found that to work that well. Um, you're supposed to spray field bindweed when it's in flower because that's when it's taking nutrients into its root and it will carry the herbicide into the plant. So I would assume that with other weeds that they will make recommendations about timing of doing various things, absolutely. Also, I'd like to thank Susan for her lovely presentation and I'd like to thank everyone for appearing tonight and um, enjoying an evening of We Talk. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>